I'm glad you guys came out to hear me talk, um, like I was saying. Um, I like talking about myself. <laughs> so I'm a little selfish. I'm just going to get that out there. Um, and you're going to understand why I'm selfish. Um, so the story goes. I usually spend my time thinking. I think a lot. I think about um, what to wear, as you can see. <laughs> I think about what to eat, um, how to carry myself. And I also think about how I fit into every situation. Um, let's say school, for instance. I think about how I fit in there. Um, in America, I think about how I fit in this puzzle. When I was back in Africa, as a young kid, I thought about how I fitted in that puzzle um, and my life and experiences and everything else that came with that. So that's always been something that I, that I enjoy doing. Um, I have this method um, set where every month or so, I just sit back and review my life um, and just figure out where I'm at. And for that reason, I'm here today talking to you. It all started in art school where um, I was presented this project by a teacher. And the project basically, the instructions were for us to go back in art history, Western art history to be more specific, um, find a master's painting and bring it to life, make it more contemporary. Um, so after a few weeks of, of research, I landed on Jan van Eyck's Man in a Red Turban painting. I'm sure you guys are familiar with that, right? OK. Um, so that painting, when I saw it, the first thing that I thought about was he's wearing a turban. I mean, there are you know, studies now that that's not, it, it wasn't really a turban, and it was a capron. Um, but initially, it's worn like a, like a turban. Uh, so when I saw that, I instantly thought, well, a turban is a, a, a very, very African thing. And in school, I mean, I didn't think that my work was going to get seen, not at that time at least. So, but even then, I thought it's my responsibility to take this back home. You know, kind of make people understand what turbans are and how that weaves into the culture and tradition that I come from. So I worked, 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 and I created a self-portrait. And when I was working, that was the same time that I was trying to figure out who I was as a person, who I was as an artist, and who I was as an African living in America. And based on what I saw on TV, on um, social media, in music, in newspapers, what have you, didn't really portray the image that I saw in my head of myself. So I, I thought that was my opportunity. Even if no one else saw it, at least I knew what I was doing or who I was. So that project led to me being interested in other African, young Africans who are in America and how they navigate their lives and what they have to go through. Because our experiences are very specific. Uh, specific. One funny thing that I learned actually when I was in school was that young African immigrants are uh, the most um, graduated out of all immigrants. But you never hear that. You never hear that. So as an artist, I thought, you know, I can paint. Why not use my, paint, uh, my, my work to actually do something important and make these stories more relevant? You know, make these stories heard. Right? Okay. 
And I did that. I did that a lot. And how do I do that? Well, it starts with hanging out at, my, at a friend's house, at a party, and meeting another African kid, right? Or just walking down the street and seeing someone who looks African or who looks like me and going, where are you from? Are you from Uganda? <laughs> or are you from Sudan? Right? It just starts like that. Or on social media, sending that weird uh, message, that weird DM, like, hey, uh, I'm a painter. You look interesting. <laughs> Can we meet? <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, so I'm sure I look like a pedophile sometimes, but, but that's not my intention. And from that, it turns into just meeting you know, another young African and just connecting. And one thing I've learned on my, um, on my journey so far is that every time I meet another African kid, connection is, is super easy. I do not have to try to be anything else but myself. And we understand that. You know, because as Africans, we are, um, how do I put it? We fit into every situation, right? Uh, so let's say I'm hanging out with um, my Caucasian friends, right? Uh, the way I speak is, is different from when I hang out with my African friends or my African American friends, right? It's, it's, if you do research, research that. <laughs> um, so I, I do not have to try. I just go up to them and we just connect. And from that point, it turns into an interview. I invite them out to dinner for coffee and we just talk about who they are. And the reason why I choose to approach my work that way is because instead of just being a painter, I feel like I'm trying to write autobiographies of these, of these people. The media doesn't do it, so I have to do it. It's my responsibility. Um, and in order for me to get the right information, I have to take my time and get to know who I'm painting, get to know their stories. And those stories that I, that I learn are highly emphasized in the work. I mean, if you can see, I mean, you can see their facial expressions. You can, I mean, you can read the titles. All of those things are specific to, to these individual stories. The stories are incredibly important. And why are these stories important to me specifically? Well, I came to the United States when I was um, 14 years old from a refugee camp that, from two refugee camps actually, uh, that I lived in for about nine years of my life. Um, and that was uh, the same place where I discovered that I had an, abil uh, an ability to, to, to paint or draw at that point. And the reason why, well that was, that was my only way of understanding where I was, who I was, what was going on. I used to stutter when I was a kid, so speaking and talking to people wasn't my way. And um, schools in the camp weren't the best. So um, the only thing that I really had to do was create something, and the more I painted, the more, well, I didn't have paint, <laughs> the more I drew. Actually, funny story, when I, when I started out, we, my mother had, well, we had nothing, really. Um, and the little that we had, um, she was trying to protect, in a sense. So when I went to school, I mean, we had one notebooks that we used for an extended period of time. Uh, what I used to do was, um, I used to uh, doodle and draw and sketch in my, in my notebooks. So when my mom discovered that I, I did that, she was very angry. I mean, just like, you're going to school and we don't have much, but you're wasting your, your, your uh, notebook papers? What's wrong with you? But I kept on doing it anyways. And eventually, I figured out a way to 
to avoid her noticing that I was doing that. And the way I did that was, I took notes, but my notes were very minimal, right? So I saved all these empty spaces in my notebooks that I eventually cut out and then created my own sketchbooks, line sketchbooks, not really sketchbooks, but, you know, it worked. You know, I did what I had to do, and I figured it out. So, fast forward, when I came to the States, young African who thought that America was heaven at one point, and now I was actually in the midst of what this idea is, right? And I had to basically figure out um, how to navigate through it. And when I went to high school, I didn't have any role models of any sort to show me the way of, of, of how to, to make that process easy. So I had to make that discovery on my own. There was this experience where, um, I think it was in, I don't remember what year, but myself and my African friends, fresh out of Africa, <laughs> fresh off the boat, I like to say, um, we, went, we were walking to the light rail, just having fun, just teasing each other. Um, and this random stranger came up to us and said, well, you guys are from Africa, right? And we're like, yeah. And she looks at, looks at us and, go, and went, uh, go back where you came from. And when that happened, I didn't really know how to feel about that. I mean, I was, I was a teenager, um, so, but I thought about it a lot. And I was trying to figure out what that meant, right? All my life, I've been in between. My mom was pregnant for me, um, with me, actually, in Liberia. And that year, there was a civil war, so she had to flee to Guinea. That's how come we became refugees, right? So that alone tells you that, well, I'm in between two places. And now, I'm in America. I'm in between two places. I'm not black enough, right? Um, I'm too black for the white kids, right? <laughs> and I'm too African for the African-American kids, <laughs> right? So I'm in this weird spectrum where only us know what the experience is like. And I feel like, once again, it's my responsibility to make that happen, tell those stories. So with the paintings, when I decided to start painting my friends and people that I randomly met, like I said previously, my intentions were to tell the story. And the more I painted, the more that story evolved. During interviews, you know, these people get to, uh, I see these young people become so vulnerable um, in front of me. I mean, they tell me all sorts of things, you know, their experiences. I actually, Alfonsine, she, uh, she was born in Zambia, and her parents are from um, Congo. So she was born, and her story is, is somewhat similar to mine. So one time, oh, well, we were talking, and I asked her, I said, do you feel more Congolese, or do you feel more Zambian? She looks at me and she goes, I feel more Zambian than Congolese. To me, that meant, well, for me, I feel more Liberian than I feel Guinean, even though I was born in Guinea. So that alone was a conflict for me. And I didn't understand, and I was trying to understand why she feels that way. And she, her point was that even though she comes from, or her parents are from a certain place, she was born in a different place, and that doesn't mean that where her parents are from is where she's from. But I see it differently. Right? 
Um, and I've heard stories about um, rape. I've heard stories about, you know, starvation. I starve myself too, so very familiar. But I've also heard stories that are not as drastic. When I say I paint young African immigrants in the diaspora, I don't mean just refugees, right? Uh, I'm trying to expand that story be beyond the refugee tale. I was refugee at one point, uh, but I've painted people who came here for school to study, right? Um, and I've, I've painted people who came here for all different sorts of reasons. Um, but I feel like there's been um, there has been, how do I put this? <laughs> there has been somewhat of a mix, mixture in the media uh, that just makes my work solely about uh, refugees, right? I mean, I respect the experiences. Um, my experiences are definitely part reason why I'm here sitting in front of you today. Uh, but I also think that that story extends further. I paint the diaspora. Uh, there are many, many interesting stories that, that come with that uh, and the struggles. Another example of being in a diaspora. One time I was going out. I mean, I was already, I was already 18 or 19 at that point. And um, I lived at home. I still live with my, with my family. So I was heading out. It was around 8, 9 o'clock um, at night. And before I left the house, I was old enough, obviously. I, I could drive. I had a job. I was res responsible enough. But my mother came up to me, and she looks at me. She's, she goes, Pepe, um, do, you, do you really want to go out tonight? And I didn't really understand. You know, I was trying to be stubborn. Like, I mean, I'm grown grown enough, like, shouldn't I be able to go out, <laughs> right? Uh, and she looks at me, she went, well, I'm worried, I just want to make sure that you come back home alive, right? And that just reminded me of living in a refugee camp where obviously we didn't have enough food and people just, people died like flies, really. Um, it, it, was, it wasn't a new thing. Every, every day, every month, someone died. That was just typical. But that just reminded me. It's just like America, in my mind, at that point was heaven. And in heaven, you're supposed to be safe. In heaven, you're not supposed to be worried about being shot when you're driving just because you're driving. Heaven should be different. But my mom is here on the other end telling me to be careful, to drive slow, um, to, to submit or act respectfully uh, when I'm stopped because she wants me back home. And experiences like that, I feel like, needs to be talked about, uh, needs to be faced, um, needs to be changed, hopefully. <laughs> I don't see that happening right now, uh, but I'm an artist, right? Anything is possible, <laughs> really. Um, you know, you make nothing out of something. So, I have five minutes, but I've ran out. <laughs> um, any questions? Where else have you exhibited? I've exhibited at the Tucson Art Museum. Um, I exhibited in New York uh, during a fair called the Moniker Art Fair, International Art Fair, um, and some local galleries also. And I'm working on some new exhibitions right now. Yes? Yes, the video project, what to expect. Um, I'll just talk about the story a little bit on how that came about. So I was in school. And, you know, this random student, right, trying to figure out how to paint and what, are you, what are he's painting about. 
And at that point, obviously, I mean, I'm a, I'm a student. Who cares about a student? But for some reason, I wanted to, to make a documentary. I, I wanted to work on that for some random reason, right? And I had this voice in my head um, that rang over and over and over. And finally, my senior year, I didn't have money to pay anyone um, to shoot me um, and tell these stories. So my senior year, I contacted my friend, who is a videographer. Actually, we met two years before I actually contacted him. And I met him through a friend, a mutual friend of ours. And she introduced us, and she said, maybe you guys can work one day on a project. I never forgot about that when she said that. It's like, huh, OK, maybe we can actually do this. And then two years later, I messaged him, and I told him, hey, Julio, I have this idea. Can we work on it? He had to interview me, obviously. It's just like, um, he had to confirm that I was actually serious and it was important enough to be filmed. Um, and after we met, he said, well, you want to start shooting next week? Next week, right? <laughs> next week. Uh, I wasn't expecting next week. I was expecting, uh, let's start next month, right? So I'm all freaking out. Like, oh, I don't even know what to do. I've never been in front of a camera before for that many hours. And then when next week came, he had a big camera following me all over at school, <laughs> right? Just following me the whole time. Julio is back there right, right now, actually, taking pictures. So give him a hand of applause. <laughs> Thank you. And um, we've been working on it since last year, um, actually about a year and a half now. And with the documentary, I wanted to basically talk about me. Like I said before, when I started, remember, I'm very selfish, right? <laughs> so it starts with me and my story. And then it goes into who I paint, some of my inspirations, why I choose to paint them. And, um, and it gives a little bit about their lives, too. Um, I'm thinking about where we've been planning series, right? Not just one, but more. This first one is going to be more me, the work, and why. And then the next series is going to be interviews with the people that I painted. So you can hear their story from them. Because I think they're, they're better at telling it than I am, even if I interview them for hours and hours and hours. Um, that's what the documentary is going to be. Oh, I will. <laughs> Questions? Yes. Okay. Right. Okay, first part, where do I see my work going? Well, so right now, <laughs> I, um, I have a few ideas in mind, um, a few different series that I want to do. I'm not really going to talk about it too much, <laughs> uh, because I'm going to let that be a surprise. But there are a few topics that I, that I need to get off my chest. Uh, so I'm going to approach those when this is done. Um, when will this be finished? I'm not sure yet. Um, when, I, when I was in school, the only thing that I had in mind was tell these stories, tell as many stories as possible. So that, that could be 20 paintings or 100 paintings. Who knows? It could be the next five years or 10 years. Um, so we'll see. And. Second part, influence. So far, I've seen positive things. One time I was um, in this space, actually, and um, 
I was dressed. It wasn't like this, let's just put it that way. I was dressed like, you know, someone who was just viewing the work. Um, but I sat in a corner, and I was just watching people look at the work. I didn't say I was the artist or anything. I just relaxed. I didn't need that attention at that point. And uh, this little girl came, and she, she looked at the work. She stepped back. And then she went back and looked closer. And I'm, I was interested. I'm just like, OK, let's, let's see. And then she goes back. And I mean, it seemed like she was pondering. She didn't understand what was going on, right? And then she came. She almost touched it. That's when I screamed. <laughs> like, don't you dare touch it. It wasn't that harsh. But I mean, even that alone, I feel like that's influence because she was a black girl, right? And how often do you see black subjects in a space like this one? So that alone, I felt like, yes, I'm actually doing something. Another story, I, um, I was out just randomly, and this white boy, he was about, I think, 12, 13 years old. And uh, he comes up to me. And very, with a very low voice, he goes, can I, can I have your autograph? <laughs> right? And I didn't hear him. So I was like, wait, what? What did you say? And he's like, can I please get your autograph, sir? <laughs> My year was made. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> um, that's how I feel about influence. And hopefully, maybe I can have a bigger impact on, on society. That's my goal. Um, so we'll see. If I can change or touch one life, then my life has been made. Yeah. Yes. Why did I do that? Ha, OK. <laughs> My mom has a lot of clothes. <laughs> she has a lot. OK, so our closet, I don't have images. Well, I can't really show images right now. But just imagine you're in like a little department store or something, and you went to like the, the fabric section. That's her closet, <laughs> right? And she has all these fabrics from, from back home. Um, that she bought here and family sent from, from back home. And she has fabrics that we brought when, when we were coming to the States. So everything is, is stored up in there. I didn't talk about this, so thank you for, for asking that question. So when I, when I was given that project in school, the first thing that came to my mind was, huh, my mom has a lot of these fabrics. Why, can't, why shouldn't I, right? So I went, once again, I took her, <laughs> I, I, I took her fabric. I didn't tell her. <laughs> I should have, but she would have been like, no, you did that with, with paper. <laughs> so I didn't tell her, and um, I used it. And then later I told her. She was like, really, you didn't tell me? <laughs> so I used her fabric to tie on my head as the turban, and that's how the fabric came along. And for Africans, fabric and fashion, clothes, is a lot. It's, it's weaved into society. Everything has a meaning, especially when you start looking at things from Mali and even other places. I mean, the symbols, everything means everything or something, right? That's how the fabric became introduced to my, uh, in my work. And so now, I paint the fabric, I cut the fabric out in the painting, and then I, I, uh, I collage the fabric on the paintings. Thank you. Thanks. 
Right. Thank you. And there was a question back there somewhere? Question? Yes. yes. Oh. <laughs> that's, a, that's a very uh, difficult artist struggle. How do you know? Well, you just let go, <laughs> honestly. Or you just have to decide um, that you're done with it. And I mean, you get it to, for me, I get it to where it needs to be. And that's it. That's how I know. <laughs> Basically, when I paint, uh, it's a conversation with me and the painting. So the painting tells me when I need to stop. And usually, if you do more than what the painting tells you, then you're going to get different results. So I stop when I'm told to stop, basically. Wait, sorry? Is there a background about these specific paintings? OK. Well, let's talk about these two small ones, because they're a little different from, from my usual paintings. So for those two paintings, or works on paper, I, um, I was thinking about what it meant, what family meant. That's why it's titled Family Album. The guy is a good friend of mine from high school. He was one of, one of the guys that we were hanging out with when that person came up and said, go back home, right? Um, and this guy on the right is my grandpa. OK. So when the war happened and my mom had to flee, she was separated from her family, friends, everyone. She was separated from my dad. I've never seen my dad. So it was just us. All I heard from her were stories of who my family is, who my grandpa was. At one point, um, well, after we came to the States, we reconnected with family. And we were told that the year that we reconnected with family, they were gonna, uh, going to celebrate my mother's life because they thought she was dead. And if my mother's dead, I won't, I'm not here, right? <laughs> so the first time I met my grandpa was when I graduated high school, and I was 18 years old. And my friend here, we hang out a lot. So in my mind, I feel my friend is more of a family to me than my grandpa. So I was trying to, in a way, get that across with these, these tiny series. So what is family? Is family blood or is family made from experiences? Anything else? Right. So I was trying to play with that whole idea. And also, with my friend, I, was, I used the fabric in such a way where he's hidden. Um, even though these are somewhat different from that, I still try to follow the same principle, where I let the painting tell stories about them and who they are. My friend sometimes uses the Africanness as a shield. Um, and the fabric is very African. We wear it every day, so 
that was the best way of doing that. Anything. You can say my hair looks funny. <laughs> I do. Yes. Uh, for these big ones, I, I, I photograph uh, my subjects. Or I don't like to say subjects. I photograph my participants, let's put it that way. Because I don't know if they'll be okay with sitting in front of me for like the whole time. I paint these because they take um, a bit um, based on, you know, everything that goes into it, um, me having to read their stories while I record their stories, me having to listen to it while I work so I'm inspired um, and all of those things. I don't know if they would like that, so I take, yes. There, there is, there is a lot of dinner sessions. <laughs> so I sketch, I don't really sketch from, from live, like some artists do when they're paint, you know, painting portraits. I usually sketch based on what I'm told. So in live, that's where I, picked up, I pick up all the man, manner, uh, mannerisms. So that way when it's time to shoot, I know what to ask them to do, or I know what to say to get them to a point where they are very authentic to themselves. One more. Make it good. <laughs> Right. Can you talk a bit more about that? How someone might use that? How you see this? How other people do? How do you wear your African? How do I wear mine? Well. I've never thought of it. I think you wear it well. Thank you. honor and to pay homage. Um, being in the middle also introduces um, a situation where at this point, I forgot to mention that we're too Western for Africans. Um, so wearing African things is a way that we, st that um, is something that we do to stay connected to the roots. Because even if I go back home right now, I'll be called, you know, the American boy, right? Instead of the African boy, even though I'm here thinking the African boy. I was speaking to my brother, who I've never seen, and he looks at me. Well, we're talking, actually on the phone, it wasn't FaceTime or anything, and he goes, why do you sound so American? <laughs> like, like, what is wrong with you? I've never met you, but you sound too American for me. Like, can you break it down a little bit? <laughs> And he's very educated, and he was telling me that. Um, so just that disconnect, dis, uh, disconnection, we try to, in a way, minimize that by wearing uh, and being looked at in this, in this realm as Africans. And you have to be proud of where you're from, too. So yeah, this helps. One more. Wait, I didn't get the I didn't get the question. Sorry. The, the sculpture, yes. So I sculpt too, by the way. Um, I didn't study sculpting in school, but a little backstory: when I was in the refugee camps, I was interested in in being a mess, also being a mess, right? So I played in a lot of mud. I basically learned how to sculpt in mud. Let's put it that way. Um, so when I, um, I took wood back in school, and we had one project where it was open, the professor said, you can do whatever you want. Obviously, I'm interested in humans and faces, so I thought, why not carve myself out of wood? <laughs> right? And that was my first, I guess, official sculpture piece. Um, so with that, I'm thinking, amongst the, the the future projects that I have in mind, I'm going to get to a, um, a time where 
I only do sculptures for a little bit because I have an idea that I need to get across through sculpture. Because um, sculpture is completely different from the two dimension, right? Um, which interests me, actually. Having to come from making a two dimensional space look like a three dimensional space and then transferring that to making a three dimensional space actually look like a three dimensional shit. Uh, uh, a space and the differences that come with that and how you get informed by sculpting and also how you get informed by painting. Somewhat of a different process. Sculpting you have to look at it from all angles uh, but painting you just look at it from one and I'm interested in that in that mix. You're welcome. I guess this is it.